Hi, welcome back to my channel. So in today's video, I'm going to be interviewing the founder of Sneak. But before we get into this video, I want to thank Sneak for sponsoring this video. And let me tell you a little bit about what they do. So there are a ton of vulnerabilities out there like SQL injection, XSS, remote code execution, and they're all very fun to exploit when you're doing it ethically, of course but they're not so fun when they're in your own applications. So that's where Sneak comes in. It automatically scans your code, dependencies, containers, and configurations, and scanning and fixing vulnerabilities in real time. So here's how easy it is. Sign up for free with my link sneak.co slash fara, import your repositories, and there Sneak finds your vulnerabilities so you can fix them with just a click. Sneak opens fixed PRs so you can merge and move on. Plus, it does it from all your existing tools, IDEs, CLIs, repos, pipelines, Docker Hub, and more. So check it out and find out if there are any vulnerabilities in your code. It's free, so sign up using my link. Okay, so today we're here with the founder of Sneak. Um, so let's just get right into it and we'll keep this super quick. So tell us about Sneak, what made you start Sneak and what problem of cybersecurity do you think you're solving with Sneak? Sure. So I guess the realization in Sneak was, you know, first that with the accelerated sort of pace of software development uh, that is happening in the world and is, you know, necessary companies need to be agile fast uh, to stay competitive, you know, ahead of the market. Um, the ability to secure software from the outside has gone away, right? It was really probably never a good idea, but in practice, uh, it's just become, you know, it went from, from a nice to have to build security into development to a must have. Uh, and um, the light bulb moment, I guess, that we had was that to achieve that, uh, if we want to get developers to embrace security, we need to build a developer tooling company, not a security company. We need to think of a company that is, uh, that kind of walks and talks and quacks like a dev tooling company that feels natural, you know, to developers as a part of their tool suite and start tackling the problem from that lens and then kind of evolve that to, you know, cover more of their concerns and and kind of help the security team uh, adapt and evolve accordingly. Yeah, I think, I think the approach of developer security has just evolved pretty recently as well. Like we're seeing DevSecOps come up as a niche in cybersecurity. But all of that has been pretty recent. And uh, I think Sneak was founded in 2015. And so right now, I think you're at a Sneak is at a position where it has a good amount of funding and it has grown a lot as a company. So what does a day in your life look like now? Um, could you walk us through like a day in your life? I, I guess I, uh, so I was, uh, when I founded the company, I was the CEO of the company. You know, the best way to become a CEO is to found a company and call yourself a CEO. So that's what I did. Uh, and uh, and kind of ran and led the company. And so at the beginning, you always uh, kind of wear many hats. Uh, and, and you know, part of it is product leadership, some of hustle, go to present to meetups, et cetera, et such. Uh, about four years in, uh, I managed to get uh, Peter McKay, who I've known for many years, to come on and join us as uh, as CEO. And I moved to a a role that was more focused on sort of longer term perspective. So I guess my job now is to look around the corner, you know, sort of understand what happens next. So, so I guess it involves a lot more talking to customers and talking to leaders who are responsible for implementing cybersecurity in their systems, right? It's it's a combo. It's also the kind of the players, you know, like new startups that are either in the dev space or in the security space to understand, you know, what's happening and you know what new technologies are coming into the fold. Uh, talk to existing customers, but also just talk to sort of people who are not customers necessarily. You know, just sort of security leaders uh, in other parts to learn from them uh, to other sort of tool providers. And to me, you know, I'm a I'm an architect at heart. You know, I sort of for me everything falls into like a certain architecture, a certain picture. And so you feed all of this information of what's happening with the product inside, what's happening with product usage, you know, by customers, what's happening in other products, and just like a lens on what you know makes sense that will transpire in the industry, uh, and and choose to to try to kind of form a, a picture. And then once a, a picture is formed. Uh, get everybody to come along, you know. So, like maybe a good example of that is uh, cloud native application security. So, uh, uh, so and this is one of, of a handful, you know. And oftentimes there's a lot of there's a lot of conversations and a lot of like information gathering 
uh, that leads to something that is hopefully a very succinct uh, uh, statement uh, about uh, what is it that we're building. So, so I know Sneak has a lot of products, like you talked about cloud, then you all also have container security, lots of open source stuff, as well as SaaS stuff. So what one product do you think would be essential for a Organize, an organization that's just trying to implement cybersecurity. So just to give you a little more context, uh, like let me talk about the startup scene in India. So there are a lot of unicorns that have been coming up, lots of consumer facing brands that are, uh, so if any breach happens, it's gonna affect their reputation directly, right? And I personally, I do not think the cybersecurity scene in India is very mature in terms of organizations implementing it. Of course, we have great engineers, but, uh, when it comes to organizations understanding the importance of cybersecurity, I don't know if that is fully mature yet. So first, how would you convince them that cybersecurity is something that's important, that's something they should care about? And what one product do you think would be essential for them to implement? Yeah, it's it's good questions. It's important, you know. So maybe starting from the motivation, I think I think the market is actually kind of going in in a good direction now. So security has always been about risk reduction, right? It's about you know you do this or else you know something terrible and existential might happen to you, uh, which is real and it's a concern, but it's also very easy to overlook. Um, I think what's happening now is uh, there's a cascading set of demands. Uh, that is coming from anywhere from like federal and regulation and sort of higher uh, financial institutions that are demanding uh, security certification, security assessments from their customers. So in the B2B space, I think it's a bit better because you see anywhere from, you know, SOC 2, which is like SOC 2 compliance is a, you know, is a sort of a common security benchmark. As to what to focus on, I guess the, the key thing is to focus on security hygiene versus the advanced persistent threat. You know, I think people, you know, hacking is very kind of, a, you know, alluring and, you know, has a, some appeal to it, to all the funky stories. But most likely nation states are not after you and they don't really care. And you're more likely to be kind of breached by an open window or an open door, right, that you forgot to lock. Um, and so, and especially with sort of organizations being decentralized uh, and, you know, teams working independently in the name of that speed that I mentioned. And so what I would recommend is to focus on these core elements of um, uh, kind of known vulnerabilities in your components and misconfigurations in your infrastructure. Um, it's hard to really prioritize between the two of them. They're both very important. So if you are heavily in the sort of infrastructure as code world and, you know, very cloud native, um, then, uh, then you know, having Snake infrastructure as code or Snake Cloud, I think, would be very important to to know those. Uh, but I think very broadly, the notion of uh, uh, open source security and kind of knowing which open source components are you even using uh, and whether they are vulnerable, you know, that's what attackers are focusing on, and so that would that's what you should be focusing on uh, in terms of fixing. So yeah, I guess I kind of named you know two or three products instead of uh, of one. But at the end of the day, we think of it as one platform that helps you secure your application. Um, so those are probably yeah. Yeah, where I would start. Yeah, no, that's great. I think uh, security hygiene and like, even if we look at the Uber example, uh, it started off with social engineering and then just those open doors were just unlocked and uh, that's yeah. how they got access, right? So security hygiene definitely is uh, something important. Um, Okay, so let's talk about education and cybersecurity education a little bit. Uh, what aspect do you think is missing from today's uh, cybersecurity education scenario? What do you think people need to be educated about more? It could be something technical or even something non-technical. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the the... So, so first of all, you know, generally, I do think that we lack in security in education about cybersecurity. It's not yet properly a part of uh, of the curriculums, and I'm not talking about cybersecurity degrees, people that go to specialize in cybersecurity, but rather emphasizing the importance of cybersecurity as a part of the regular sort of uh, development, uh, uh, sort of like uh, developer education uh, tools. You know, anywhere from boot camps on one side to sort of full on degrees on the other. Um, and so I think it's important to emphasize it, not so much on sort of the depth of like dedicated security, but rather on security as part of your job. Um, I think the, uh, the the key thing to emphasize, I think, in education is to just sort of demystify 
some of security. For a lot of people, the response when they think about security is that it's very complex, it's very big, it's very elaborate. Um, and it's not, you know, most of it is indeed security hygiene. Most of it is just sort of taking a moment to think about what would happen if, right, if I, you know, can I contain the system to do the minimum that it needs to do versus the maximum? Because we think about the the intended consequence of, you know, if a user clicks this button, they successfully add an item to their shopping cart, but we don't think about, well, what if they click the button a thousand times in sort of, you know, one second, what happens then? You know, we don't think about uh, the unintended consequences. Of yeah, that makes sense. And I think what we don't understand is that I think sometimes secu the security industry is in a bubble where they think uh, everyone, it's so obvious to enable two-factor authentication or it's so obvious to keep strong passwords and use a password manager. But uh, maybe that is not so obvious to someone else who's who might click on that link or who might give away a password. Um, so yeah, that's that's yeah. definitely an aspect of uh, education, which I think would be cybersecurity awareness or something. Yeah, and I think um, you know, so I like to model. I've uh, my previous startup was in the uh, web performance space, you know, making websites faster, and got acquired by Akamai, uh, and I was CTO there, for, and a part of the sort of the DevOps world in its inception, in sort of the first uh, sort of stretch of five six years, um, and a big part of DevOps, which I think is a good role model for DevSecOps and for security. Um, was around embedding. It's about walking a mile in, in their shoes uh, and having you know developers carry a pager you know for a bit and you know see what happens now. That's maybe the norm. And then having also operations people try to sort of deliver some software uh, and sort of see the constraints. And I think we lack that as well in security. The top teams I'm seeing are doing that. Are doing that type of embedding. Uh, they're hiring people with coding and engineering skills into the security team. Because I feel, you know, oftentimes from securities, like, why didn't you just do this? You know, like, why why didn't you bother, you know, thinking about the security problem? And they forget the fact that developers need to, like, they're primarily compensated, primarily incentivized by building functionality. And you want them to do that. Otherwise, the company can't afford to pay your paycheck. You know, they like, it's important for them to build that. Um, and I like, uh, I interviewed uh, Deb from uh, Figma, he's the CISO there, he's amazing. Uh, and he had this great perspective and he was saying that when he comes to a developer and asks them to do something, he's almost apologetic. Uh, he says, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I haven't found a way in which you don't need to worry about this yet. So in the meantime, you know, I'm going to need you to do X, Y, Z. You know? And and I think that's the right lens, which is, you know, how do we how do we help that? And of course, similarly, we need the developer side to sort of understand and appreciate the importance of security. So this this notion of embedding and and being um, building up more empathy, you know, for both sides, uh, I think was core to DevOps, and I think it's core to DevSecOps to be successful. Yeah, yeah, I don't think there should be any kind of blame culture around this. Everyone's trying to do their job, so just being empathetic really helps. Um, so I wanted to ask you, in terms of technical skills, what skills do you think? should be learned for the future? Like in the next two, three years, what do you think people should upskill? Which area should they upskill in? Uh, people in the security scene? Uh, I think just in general, in general yeah. tech. Yeah, well, you know, I think the obvious answer is AI. You know, I don't think everybody needs to become sort of a data scientist and sort of, you know, do a PhD in, uh, in statistics, uh, but, but rather just, just like the notion of coding as literacy, you know, just like you need to understand that cloud allows you to do elastic computing. Uh, I think it's very important for, for people to build an appreciation of what AI can do and how do you engage with AI. Uh, it's evolving at a very rapid pace. Um, and it, it, it sort of, um, uh, it changes the paradigm of what is possible. Uh, and so I, I absolutely believe that uh, that we need to kind of shake off, you know, the thought of, you know, software can't do this or it can't do that and try to build an AI, uh, an appreciation for what can be done with AI today or later or soon. Um, and so AI, I think, is something that people need to to understand how to how to be AI users, AI consumers, you know, of course, for a subset of people, you know, AI uh, builders. So I think I think that's uh, that's key. And I guess related to that is I would say, uh, 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 specifically, I find data pipelines to be a really, really interesting space. So the whole DBT world and uh, um, and the idea of having basically data transformation as code in, in a way, I don't know if that's the best way to sort of uh, interpret that, because again, it's sort of, it changes a bit of a perspective of how can you move data from one place to the other, and it allows 
allows for decisions to come from from connecting many different sources of information and then draw a conclusion, whether simple rule system based or dashboards or of course AI again. Uh, so I think those are are the areas that I would invest. Okay, that's really interesting. So. Uh... When it came to you personally, how did you upskill in the early stages of your career? How did you learn new skills? I think I think you want to sort of dive into it. Is kind of the uh, the uh, the shift of it. I have uh, there was a Mark Andreessen quote that I that I really like uh, that it's something along the lines of you know swap career planning for strategic opportunity taking, uh, and uh, it's definitely been sort of my guiding factor. It wasn't like you know, I need to go through these like seven steps to sort of, you know, get to the destination, but rather, you know, I want to be involved and helpful and constantly seek to kind of grow my impact. And that includes learning things and just, you know, when there's a need, roll up your sleeves and, and learn into it. And, and I think that like being able to learn topics comes with an appreciation that failure is is a learning opportunity, you know, whatever another catchphrase there is, you know, you, you either win or you learn, you know, there's no losing. So you want to be in, in a position in which you, you try something new and it doesn't work and you try it again versus getting dispirited by the, uh, the learning. And so I think a lot of it is really around that people, people fear change too much and my view of the world is that if you're if you're comfortable, you're not learning, you're not growing, uh, and it's it's just literally the same continuum. Like the more comfortable you are, it's because you're in your comfort zone, and it means you're not trying new things, you're not expanding your comfort zone. And so I would say, yeah, lean into uh, when there's an opportunity th that seems interesting, lean into it, see if you can help, and you may or may not succeed, but either way, you will be better. Uh, at the end of it. And when you've done that enough, you know, for some of them, hopefully, you know, you do succeed and they propel you forward. Yeah, I mean, that's that's some great advice. So uh, yeah, thank you for that. I definitely think failure is, uh, it's hard to accept. So it can, it can be a little uncomfortable, but uh, yeah, th thanks for the advice. Um, so uh, overall, like what problems do you think right now are, uh, sort of unsolved in cybersecurity and how do you think those can be solved by people building products around those problems? There's a lot to solve in cybersecurity, right? The um, the challenge with cybersecurity is that unlike, um, unlike other areas, there is an, a villain you know, here. So when you talk about resilience, when you talk about quality, when you talk about, you know, analytics and all of these things, there's things that you could be doing better or could be doing worse, but nobody's out to get you. Nobody's actually trying to sort of actively seek out your mistakes. And security, you know, that is precisely what is happening. Um, and so naturally, uh, there's always opportunities around new threats, you know, to today, you know, with any new technology or new practice, you know, come new threats. And so you see, uh, indeed, like machine deception in, in AI, trying to sort of trick models. You you see there's a lot in smart contracts and sort of crypto lands. All of these are like new technology frontiers and therefore new security frontiers. Um, in, in most of them, the market is not immediately opportunity, like not an immediate opportunity because it's still nascent, but it's starting to be that and we need to build security solutions for it. I think for the broader sort of scene and broader market, the key, key goal is to make security easy. Uh, sometimes, I think that can be done really with either by moving things into the platform. So can you can you just make a problem go away? A great example there is like how React has built, you know, process scripting protection into the very platforms. Just make it go away. I don't need to worry about this anymore. Um, or by making it easier for indeed the decision maker by sort of embedding it into the creation process um, and, uh, and and just again sort of simplify uh, uh, make it visible at the right time and then make it actionable talk about you know what is it that uh, that you're doing and always with with sort of an empathy to the broader reality of that user and I mean I'm most familiar with it in in developer land but it, increasingly in companies everybody's a creator whether it's a no code platform, or it's sort of empowered marketing team that's doing campaigns. And so in all of these, every time they make a decision, there's some security implication to it. 
Um, and I think understanding that there is sort of a security gap uh, over there and then what's the best way to identify that and flag that to the user at the right time, these things tend to sort of multiply quickly. I mean, it was definitely what fueled SNCC's growth, which is if you kind of crack that developer experience of flagging the right issue at the right time, then you know the developer will uh, uh, is more likely to act on it, you know, with sort of the right guidance, and you end up being more secure. But the same is true for for a variety of uh, uh, of security impacting kind of decision. So I don't know if it's like I don't have a hey you should fix X Y Z, um, but I think that's the lens through which I I see this. Yeah, I think I think the key takeaway here is just to make security easy. Um integrate it as much as you can with the developer uh, with what the developer is doing which i get where sneak comes from uh comes from the same place so uh yeah, yeah. that makes sense so uh i think uh this would this next question would be the last one um so how would you how do you evaluate colleagues and how do you seek out friends Ooh. Uh, <laughs> well, so first and foremost, I want to work with people that actually enjoy their company. And so I think that naturally uh, means people that, um, that don't just, you know, seek to, to uh, you know, to kind of get personal gain, you know, that are happy to uh, be a bit more open as, an, as, a, as a human, you know, and sort of share those. I'm a very, uh, a very transparent person, you know, in terms of what's happening in my personal life. I don't, I don't like... Um, you know, I like less people that are like, they're purely in the work and 100% of what we talk about is the work. And so I prefer colleagues that that I, I, know, I guess the term is that I can grab a beer with, you know, but, you know, it's really around, you know, that I can uh, have, have fun with uh, because life is too short and you spend a lot of time at work and you want it to be with people that you like. And, and I guess very related to that, uh, and this is true for people I hire and for people I, um, you know, I like to be with, is is I I just have a very hard time with uh, arrogance. You know, I uh, I think humility is not the same as as uh, as lack of confidence. You know, you can be like I personally feel like I'm a fairly confident person, and I have, I trust my skills. And at the same time, I'm very aware that uh, you know the vast vast majority of things that there are to learn, I do not know. You know, and that there's like so much I don't know, and so many mistakes that I make all the time, and and so. To me, it's like it's exciting to be wrong. You know, it's sort of uh, it's exciting to debate a topic and change my mind. Um, and uh, and I like I like being with people like that, right? I like be being with people who are curious, who who seek out new knowledge, who seek to be challenged, because uh, I like intellectual kind of exchanges and sort of uh, uh, debates. Um, and and you know, I guess the best ones are the ones in which you change your mind, right? Because you've learned something new uh, and you do those. So this notion of of humility and smarts, you know, with them, you know, someone who, who can kind of analyze uh, our property that I look for. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, so I I'm uh, I think this is the end of it. I really want to thank you for taking your time out and uh, answering my questions. I definitely think there are some gems hidden in this interview. So uh, both for people who are aspiring to be founders as well as people who are just getting into cybersecurity and learning. Um, so thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Well, happy to be here. Thanks for uh, helping kind of spread the knowledge. All right. Okay.